Okay, so with that, I'll jump in and welcome everyone. Um, I shared with a few of you just before we started, but my name's Alex. I think I know several of you already, so I won't go too much into formalities, but uh, I'm based in Dubai. I'm the founder and chief exec of Boldly. I've been working with Pauline for, I was trying to think when I, before I came in the call, maybe 15 years or so. 14 so. years, yes. There you go. <laughs> I count on you for precision. Um, so, you know, we've had a great working relationship for quite some time, even before we, we jumped into this business of Boldly. And um, I have been so pleased to, to be a colleague, an industry peer. And I know now the work she's doing with Boldly mm -hmm. to bring coaching and um, our, our level of standards, our level of coaching uh, excellence out to clients in Europe is something that I'm very confident in. So really pleased to, to have her showcase this work today and to meet all of you. Um, this topic of hybrid teams, uh, I was saying before, it's become quite innocuous, this word hybrid. I think everybody talks about it. It's, um, it's a natural part of our life now. Of course, post COVID, we we got this rude shock into, into work from home and then this settling period that we've had post COVID has, has meant that we've got some companies that are in the camp of 100% work from office, some that are 100% remote, but the majority of companies are in this middle, middle world of hybrid where we've got a combined effect. And that doesn't even have to be work from home or work remote. It's companies that are cross geography, companies that are um, you know, working with stakeholders in, in other, other client businesses. The reality is that hybrid is very pervasive now. And yet what we find is the clients that we work with, they're not investing in the skills it's not a mindful step into hybrid, it's a reactive step into hybrid. So with work we've been doing with clients all around the world um, has been to bring intentionality, to bring skills and resources into this hybrid work model so that for the new world of work, we actually have the resources that we need. And that's for managers, for staff, for teams at all levels of that system to make sure that hybrid, you know, isn't a Band-Aid effect, but is really something we can thrive in. So really pleased to, to discuss this with you today. We, we've had this topic on Roadshow because we have several clients around the world working with us proactively on, on this topic. We've delivered it in Australia, New Zealand, Asia and LATAM. And now I'm so pleased that uh, Pauline's bringing it to, to clients in Europe and um, actually has clients who we're working with on this as well. So what it means to be hybrid, we'll dig into that. I think, again, it's, it's become common knowledge, but let's define it. What are the implications of the hybrid model? Signs that hybrid is suffering. So some of these, I think a lot of you are practitioners, but um, being able to diagnose that perhaps the hybrid model is at the heart of some things you're seeing in your teams. How coaching can play a role. And specifically, we've got a model that um, Pauline will introduce around enabling hybrid skills through the leader and through the team and what those implications are for you if you're in HR role or we've actually got resources for coaches here as well. So with that, I'll hand over to Pauline, but I will say we'd love, as I said before, this is a cozy meetup, let's call. I'm very happy to have Q&A for you to interject, for us to have discussion. And of course, the chat is there as well for us to, to discuss. But thank I think you. Pauline, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Alex. I just want to introduce myself quickly. So um, I'm based in Brussels. I'm, um, I'm a specialized in learning and development. I'm a PCC coach. And um, as Alex said, we, we worked together um, when I was living in Shanghai. So it means that since then, we are also working as a hybrid team, a remote team. So it's nice to see that what we share today is something that we've put in place uh, in our team as well. So if we start with the first slide, Alex, that's for you to explain shortly, boldly to, uh, to the audience. Yeah, please let me introduce. So essentially, Boldly does everything coaching end to end. We work with clients at, you can see the bottom of this screen on the left. We have a coach marketplace where we can allow clients to come through, uh, meet, select, screen and book a coach directly themselves. So it's really a very um, uh, hands on, easy access experience to meet coaches all around the world who we've screened and vetted onto our, our platform. But from that platform, we then offer additional coaching services. So in that midsection, the number two, we have coach-led learning, very much uh, facilitated small groups, question asking, discussion style, but we have aligned those learning programs around key talent. So 
first time managers, leaders, high potential females, et cetera. And then at the top end of that jigsaw, we have our coaching culture advisory. So based on the coaching work that we can do globally and the learning programs, we're able to work with clients on how to knit in coaching as a strategic uh, enabler of transformation and learning and uh, your internal culture. Uh, and to really make sure that if you have a small army of coaches within your business, that they're working effectively, they're aligned to a model, they're aligned to your business strategy, and that we can have some some measures and some return on investment across those coaches. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, really pleased to introduce the business. Thanks, Pauline. So um, we we found a research, which is actually a, a recent one, you know, from Forbes in 20, May 2024. So it's a, a very um, hot one, we found that nearly 75% of the respondents say that their employees haven't trained managers to lead a distributed team, established team or team norms or adopted best practices to support working across the instance. Considering that nearly 60% of employees now have the option to work remotely, it's concerning that employers and managers either still don't know how to manage hybrid teams or they are being reluctant. So what's the deal here? So it's, really, it's interesting to understand that since five years or four years, you know, with the change from, from before and after COVID, everything that the managers have done, um, you know, they were like in a funnel during the pandemic. They had to work, continue to produce, continue to be productive with their, with their team. And it's not like spontaneously that they left the head out of their, their um, wheel to see, okay, where, I'm, where am I going and how do I manage the team? So the, the, um, the question here is that they fall into this unintentionally. So they, they were not um, on, the, on the driver's seat to decide, okay, now let's shift from non-hybrid and at, at the office model to a hybrid model. And that's the difficulty that most of the managers have today is that many tools are existing, you know, the now Teams, Zoom, um, well, you name it, Google Meet and so on are there. So we have many tools to support hybrid teams. But what about the managers? What about their soft skills? What about their people management skills to support them in this shift from before to um, after? Um, and this new operating model is now the new norm. That's the new normal. So the purpose today is to give you some takeaways so that in your practice as coach, as um, consultant, as a HR manager, or as a service provider in HR, you can Okay, advise your client, your internal client, and also your direct client with some, okay, how do, how do we bring that um, to the light to, so that everyone becomes more conscious about the situation? Um, so hybrid means many things. So I don't know, um, Christine, if you have, what would be your definition of hybrid? Yeah, basically to be able to work uh, from home, um, let's say two or three days per week. Okay. Yeah. And what's your definition, Siru, of a hybrid? Thank you, Christine. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, interesting. The younger generation, they the first question they have for headhunters is, can I work from home? If not, mm -hmm. then I'm not interested in the job. So I think that could be that I'm, I'm, I'm completely working from home. But then again, I might come to the offices if there's some team development or some team activities yes. going on. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there are different definitions of hybrid. We can see this as flexible work arrangements. You know, there is no specific time. We used to work nine to five or nine to six, but now you can start very early in the morning, go for, you know, a walk outside, get back to your, to your desk and work later at night. It's very different than before. Um, it's also a mix from office and remote work as well. Um, now the place is also no, not more, no more constraint as we used to have before because you can work. I have friends over the summer, they spend a, um, a week uh, in Portugal for work, but they were out of the office, but um, a workstation, as they said. So it's interesting because, because it's also hybrid. Yeah, workstation, thank you. Um, so it's also a mix between human interactions and communications alternating between online, face-to-face, -face, and a combination of both for team meetings. So there is a real blend here. And it's not always easy with these blurred um, borders to see, okay, it's very dynamic, okay, it's very emergent, it's very unpredictable. And that's the, 
I feel like from my client, that's the major challenge that they have is that it's very much interconnected, very much complex. Um, and it's hard to define a, um, always a red, a red line to, to follow the path because that will be always changing. That's now the, the day to day is very different from one day to the other. Another way to explain hybrid is, I'm sorry, I'll just go back here. Um, as I said, you can work from home, um, you can work from um, the office, you can work from anywhere, you can work from, from a hub or remote. So now there is a diversity in the place where you can work. Uh, you know, you also have the nomad, I mean, everything is now possible. So the, the main thing is that before you, we had, as you can see, the red dot, we were constrained at the office from nine to five. And we, I believe, all started our career with that, right? knowing that we will go in the office in the morning, leaving uh, later on, and whatever the, the dishwasher to empty out or the, the nice walk with friends for um, to chat, that was not possible. Now it's very much more com I mean, flexible, that's for sure, because we can work from anywhere, from any time um, in the office. So that's a real blend between constraint and unconstraint. And the challenge as well for the companies is that today, as you said, Siru, you know, the, the more junior people, they say, OK, do I need to work every day in the office? And if it's a yes, they might not consider the job. So that's now their new norm. Why we are with our generation, we see that differently as well. Right. So how can we support this complexity more intentionally? OK, the idea is to, to remove ambiguity and to remove complication, to remove confusion so that you can be more I have a, a clear communication and explicit communication as well. Alex, I don't know if you would like to add anything at this stage. Yeah, just to comment that, I mean, we have a lot of clients who say mandate back to the office. Okay, there's, a, there's companies who are just culturally, they say, unless I can see you, I'm not confident that you're working. And we're going to talk a bit about trust down the track. So there's still a lot of companies in that, that category. I would argue they are still working hybrid. Even if their employees are back in the office, they have office to office. So someone is always going to be online in an online relationship. And they have their vendors, partners who are in all manner of work situations. If your vendor is out walking his dog when he takes the call from you, is he still working? Well, yes, he is. So you still need as a manager and as a vendor relationship manager, you still need to have the skills to work in a, in a hybrid system, even if your company itself is in a mandated work from office. <laughs> so this skill is pervasive no matter whereabouts your client falls on or your company falls on that, this, this four, four matrix here. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pauline. Yeah. So what we see is that the leaders um, need to be able to lead differently, right? Because it's about complexity is about intention as well and it's very different than what they used to do before and that's okay but the idea is that for us as you know supporting their um, the leaders in their growth uh, is to make sure that they have the tools and that they have the right um, framework of minds somehow to be able to work um, with with their team so Satya Nadella is the CEO of Microsoft um, they made a very large study around uh, 2022. And what he said is that everything becomes more complex, not less complex in hybrid work, right? So complexity is one of the key words here. Um, intention as well is a key word as well. Removing ambiguity is also one of the key words here to remember in this um, presentation. So we, we've made our research as well. Um, they are still emerging. So it's hard to say that there is one trend in Europe. It's much easier to do in Asia and in Australia, New Zealand as well, because, they, because of, the, of the size of the region, there, there is more a, a common uh, way of studying the, the region, which is not always the case in, in Europe. Um, the numbers will, will tell you something, but here what I want to tell you is that Working from home is now a legal right across Europe, right? Um, it means that the, even if the young generation, um, pardon, even if the, the whatever the generation would like to work um, also um, from, okay, I'm starting my sentence again. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the, 
what we see is that the office first hybrid model is where organizations control when employees work remotely is the most common setup. It means that the companies, they decide on the setup, they decide on how many days they will work from home or from the office, but the entry point is that they work from the office, right? It's not that they work from home. That's different. The, the, that was different during the pandemic. So what we see, and I have a client who said that to me recently, um, she's based in Asia, and she said to me now, Pauline, it's a nightmare. She's a HR manager is a, in a very large company, a worldwide company. And she said, it's a nightmare because now we are in a new policy. It's work from the office five days a week. And she said it's a nightmare to hire a young generation, as you mentioned, Siru. And it means that from one hand, it's hard to recruit and to attract talent. But on the other hand, internally, they also need to re-recruit their employees, right? They need to have a campaign internally. To, okay, what's in it for me to be back in the office again? Um, we've seen that Amazon has done that in the US, um, Google as well. So there is really a shift and it means that, again, the, the, the word complexity takes, again, a, a very important um, role here. Knowing that the workforce is very demanding, um, even for the people from our generation, we experienced the uh, difference between working from home and working from the office. And we like, most of the time, like the flexibility of being able to arrange our, our work schedule. So, so yeah, can I? Can I Please. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Suddenly we all want to, to ask questions. I don't know. Can I interrupt now or shall we? Uh, please, yeah, please go ahead. Later. Yeah. Yes. No, because uh, I um, we, uh, Phoenix, did a research um, two years ago. And it was also very uh, interesting to realize that people in Northern Europe really prefer to stay at home or to work from home. Whereas people in Southern Europe, they want to go to the office. So there is also a um, different mentality. So, and I can imagine that for a company, yeah, so global company, it, it's difficult to uh, install rules when you have different, uh, yeah, preferences depending on the region. Yeah, that's uh, that's certainly um, an important aspect for the for the HR and for the the one deciding on the right the hybrid or remote or from home. Alex, you want to say something? Another another interesting thing about working from home in Southern European countries is that, although I cannot believe it, but apparently a lot of people said, you know, we don't have air conditioning at home. So mm -hmm. when we are in the office, we have a much cooler uh, working environment during the summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was so going to be my... There are cultural things as well in play. Mm -hmm. Definitely. cultural and practical as you said it's um you know not having an air conditioning is is um is you know <laughs> being close to the equator what did was there anything else you attributed that to christine the difference between northern and southern europe the because i'm thinking family yeah, side. It's, um so according to uh our findings this was really that northern people are considered uh of being more introvert whereas mm -hmm. people in southern europe they like to to have this uh, contact with people while they are, they are at work. Mm. So that was the main difference. And of course, air condition <laughs> as well. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We found some similarities in our Asia research, um, ve very similar to the fact that, you know, people in Hong Kong are typically living in smaller compact uh, apartments don't necessarily have the space to set up a home office or even a desk next to the bed to, you know, to be able to create a work from home environment. And even if you do set up a desk next to the bed, you lose the transitional space. You know, the a lot of people are used to the commute as the gear up into work and then the gear down <laughs> back to home life. And so if all you're doing is rolling out of bed to the seat next to you, you've lost the transitional space of switching codes, right, between home life and, and work life. Whereas people in Australia and New Zealand who typically have more space and who can typically create a work from home environment, but also who have less childcare, wanted to be able to work from home so that they could, you know, because they enjoy their space and they, they could set up a nice desk but it means at 3.15 they could duck out, get the kids and get back and still be at work. 
Whereas in Hong Kong, where people traditionally have more domestic help, they're not having to make the consolidation for school drop-off pickups. So I think there is, like, the reality is mm -hmm. <laughs> hybrid, makes, yeah. your house, your family, it's your, yeah. <laughs> Which makes me curious, do you have, have an idea about Japan? <laughs> so uh, did you uh, speak with people in Japan? Definitely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the... Um, because the work participation of females who are um, parents in Japan is still so low. There was really typically a conflict in the home space of how does one parent work and one parent take care of the children. <laughs> so a lot of, you know, sort of outdoor time, but there wasn't necessarily the conflict of um, I'm a parent and I need to go back to the workforce as well. There's still much more traditional roles. So split it was the confines of the space, but not the confines of the the conflict of the family responsibility, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think, Sylvie, you also had a question or something. Yeah, add. I was wondering, Pauline, when you gave the example of the company who took the decision to oblige people to come back to work. Yes. I mean, it's it's a lot of implications and it's against the tendency of the moment. Do you know what they're thinking, what their reasoning is behind that? Why they chose for that? I, I have little knowledge on the reasons. I think but it's that. control. We see that later. Yeah. It's, uh, indeed, when you don't see people, you don't think that they are productive, right? So, yeah. and we see that later as well. It's also a question of trust. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the thing is that most of the time the companies are reducing their office space as well. So I'm wondering how they will manage also on the long run, uh, because many um, offices have changed in since four years. Um, yeah. So for the moment, I don't have an answer. Um, I, I didn't ask on the on the strategic, uh, you know, decision of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having, I was just having, curious. No, but it's a good question <laughs> of having people again back in the office. Uh, but I was mostly like. Okay, that's a very big challenge for HR, you know, mm -hmm. to recruit people that are okay to come five days in the office. And you remember four years ago, five years ago, that was the norm. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we, we shifted very quickly. Um, I mean, four years, but we shifted now the, the mindsets very differently. Mm -hmm. Alex, anything to add so far? Yeah, I don't know about that one client that Pauline spoke to, but across the board, we're seeing a multitude of factors that um, in some cases it is leadership personality style if that leader has made an assumption that unless i see you working you're not working <laughs> then that can permeate through the policy and the discussion in some cases it is more uh, macroeconomic in terms of governments creating incentives because they want their central business district to come back alive or property property players giving uh, discounts to get people back into the office. So there can be economic drivers, especially coming off the back of COVID where so many companies, you know, took a hit and now they're having to make up for that within their 10 year plan. So um, again, it is that control element I would say is, is lying underneath it. But I mean, for some of it, I think there is philosophy as well of, okay, well, if we have blue collar workers in our ranks and of course they, necessarily must be at their workstation is it then fair or is it you know somehow lofty and and um elitist for our white collar workers not to also have to be at their workplace so there's some of those arguments that come through which i think are more good-hearted and more egalitarian that we we discount sometimes so mm. a multitude of factors yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, so let's move on and look at the, the implications of the, of the hybrid model. Um, there are positive things, of course, but there are also things to work on, right? Um, again, this survey from Microsoft, so they did a very large survey. You can see uh, 68,000 employees operating this hybrid context. What they found is that it's very dense within the team. So within each team, the relationship is, is, um, is uh, stronger. But then it's per team. So it's everything is on now on a silo, which is actually means that there is less connection between all the different teams. And that becomes a problem. You will see, we will see that later on as well. So more, more in a silo, it means that the network is more static. People don't see each other at the coffee machine or at the cafeteria. Um, they don't chat um, you know, on, on a nice chat as you can have in the, in the corridor. They don't do that anymore. So it means that they will write an email instead of 
picking up their phone also because people are hiding behind their screen sometimes, which is much easier because they might not have met this, this new colleague from another department. Um, so it's more vertical collaboration. Um, the, the communication tools are um, much less rich and it decreases also a transfer of knowledge and quality of output. And what we have seen is also decreases the innovation somehow because people are less you know, working together and um, brainstorming together just because they don't see each other. Um, if they see each other, they need to have a specific meeting, set up something. So it's more formal now than it was informal in the past. Um, there is another aspect that uh, we have seen is that um, a manager is actually a manager of the work and of the person, right? You need to make sure that your team is productive, is effective, and realizing the, out the outcomes that are needed to, to perform the job. And on the other hand, you are a people manager. So you are supporting your, your, your team members in their development. So you need, one, on one hand, more data reasoning. And on the other hand, you also need more empathy, right? More human connection with people. What we have seen is that in the hybrid model, having all these behind the screen um, meetings, uh, it's very hard to combine the empathy and the data reasoning at the same time. Um, and that's very interesting to see is that, of course, it can reduce the motivation. It, it can reduce also the results as such um, because the, the, the connection is less uh, present as, um, as uh, it should be normally um, in the people management face to face. Another aspect, um, let's move on on this slide because there is another aspect that I would like uh, to explain is that um, the hybrid model has put a lot of pressure on the on the organizations, right? And as I said, um, one of the costs is that there is less innovation. So what we need today is to support the team and make sure that inside the team, the foundation is very, you know, very solid. And to have a solid foundation, we need trust. And what is the trust? If there is an equation, very simple one, but very useful one. When you understand that, you will use that a lot, I can tell you. So the trust is uh, the combination of credibility. So the credibility will be the attitude, the knowledge, the competence. You know, that's, that's the track record that you have as a, as a, as a manager. The, rel the reliability is the walk the talk, okay? You, you, do it, you say that you, you will do something, you do it as well. The intimacy is uh, the, the emotional connection that you have with someone. So we, in French, we, in French we, we use vulnerability, okay, vulnerability, which is actually a way to connect as a human being. We more and more um, speak about being authentic as a leader. This is where the intimacy can uh, come into play. So if you have a good balance between credibility, reliability, intimacy, and this is actually an equation because under that you have self-orientation. We can call it ego as well. So that's being putting the focus on yourself or on the others. If it's not on balance, in, if it's unbalanced, then there is no trust. So what we see in the teams today is that there is a very good level of credibility, a good level of reliability, but there is a lack in terms of intimacy. One of the reasons is because people mm -hmm. don't see each other a lot. Okay, again, the coffee machine has a real a crucial role in a company. Going for lunch with your, with your colleagues has also a role as well. Networking internally or externally is also very important. So what I mean here is that by the moment in a team where the foundation is strong, then you can move further on innovation. You can bring results. You can have more, you know, more um, accountability, more team empowerment. But first of all, you need to have this level of trust that is very important uh, in a team. So that's a real challenge for the, for the managers today. Um, and I think that's very interesting to know the, this equation because it helps also to know where to develop uh, the team um, and each team member as well. There are exercises for that, of course. Pauline, kind of building on this, I'm also wondering that you know, we talk about how do we develop and foster highly performing teams? And if the, you know, the sense of belonging and the uh, psychological safety, if they are elements. So I think it's very challenging, at least leaders said, it's very challenging for me to build these aspects in my team. How do I build sense of belonging when 
we never see one or another. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's that's a real challenge indeed. Mm-hmm. And and um, what I believe is that the um, uh, trust can help um, working together because um, it's it's another way of 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 discussing. For instance, what we do, and we are uh, at Boldly, we are a hybrid team, a remote team. Somehow, because my colleague Alex is based in in the Middle East, I have a colleague based in Hong Kong, another one based in Australia, and so on. So we always start, you know, the town hall meetings with a nice chat, you know, with some games as well, just so that, okay, we learn about each other. Uh, There are colleagues I never met, but that's okay. I feel connected to them because I know what was their favorite song when they were a child. I know what was their first job. I know their favorite color. And okay, it sounds a little bit... Um, kind of, you know, simple, but it's also important to build this this trust within the team, um, even though we never met uh, in real. I don't know if you want to add something or anything, Alex, uh, as well. Yeah, I I put all of those things too under the bucket. Trust, definitely, but I put them in the bucket of rituals as well. Teams who have rituals (laughs) can build psychological safety, can build belonging because you know, if you know this is the thing that we all share, (laughs) then that can happen virtually as well as in a hybrid. Some people in the room, some people online. So rituals, I would say, is essential. Another element that Pauline brings into her training program with managers on this topic is disclosure, effective disclosure. Teams who have the, the trust level to make disclosure to each other of the vulnerabilities, but creating space for disclosure, you know, not over disclosing, but, you know, if my kid walks in the room and I tell you that he has a sore throat, you know, small disclosures that bring my life into our relationship that I believe builds builds that connectivity. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot with the leader in particular, because the leader is that node of the culture to the team, that the leader has to have a lot of intentionality. Um, if the leader can bring awareness to how communication happens, the rituals that they're bringing into play, if that intentionality is very strong, then that creates the foundation of trust and, and belonging and et cetera. But a lot of work we do with leaders and coaching in this space is bringing it to a very purposeful space of, of what are you doing to open those doors? <laughs> Tell me the facts. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say. The, the, the thing, as you know, Siru, in your work, it's um, a lot of the things that we say, they were the, the old best practices, are still the new best practices in this hybrid world it's just that they're so much more acute now because we have the remote relation the the invisibility if somebody's suffering at their desk for four days and I don't talk to them to the fifth day I don't know and so that invisibility is what's made some of these critical management 101 skills so much more important to to get right and and indeed again for the psychological safety um as long as you can have this open communication it helps it helps a lot and that's one of the tool of the of the manager right in this hybrid world is to make things more explicit you know explain and make it a more open book um there are still things that they won't disclose that's that's their um life or that's their uh, strategy but be the, the most explicit you can be the better it is for the team that's for sure and you can only be explicit by the moment you also have trust you see so that's why i say that trust for me is really a foundation of being able to work together and as alex said this is was the same five years ago it's still the same today but it's just that the perspective we have on this on this trust on on this tool um, takes another color, in fact, um, and that's that's basically um, one of the message. So, Alex, I hand over to you to explain um, the signs that hybrid teams um, are, are suffering. Yeah, let me just mention this briefly because I think everyone here is, is savvy to this, and and Pauline's got a great model to start walking us through some very practical tips. Um, so, if I just move on to the next slide, Pauline. There's, there's a lot of things here that I think you all will say, okay, well, it's very hard to say that that's causality, not a correlation. We know in the HR world it's it's messy to demonstrate a really linear line between, you know, the cause and the effect. But the things you would expect, if you're seeing issues with productivity and engagement, communication is a big indication of, you know, we're, we've created more barriers now to overcome. So if this was already a problem, it's accentuated. 
Um, feelings of isolation, we definitely hear about disconnection. We know that loneliness is a big global pandemic and, and it's one that we have to be conscious of in our own businesses too. So the rise of loneliness, not 100% related to hybrid, but definitely is a compounding factor. Blurred work-line boundaries. As I said, that 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 25-year-old in Hong Kong who's rolling out of bed and they have one foot before they're at their work desk, it's very hard to create the boundaries then for them to compartmentalise what is their identity related to their work versus related to their home. And then the lack of career development opportunities. If I'm not being seen, if I'm not at the water cooler, as Pauline said, if I'm not in front of stakeholders who are making decisions, how does my career actually work now? Can I be visible, raise my profile and influence people in this, this more complex environment? So all of those things, I think, as, as I mentioned, they can be related to hybrid, they can be related to work culture. We've written a, a resource here that we can share after the, after the call. It's very much created as a hiring manager primer. So for those of you who are practitioners, this won't be the in-depth tool. But if you're trying to open up a conversation to say, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Hiring Manager, some of these things that you're seeing in your team may be related to the fact that you now have a more complex work environment, here's a resource to read just to bring it onto their agenda so that you can open up a coaching conversation and open up some, some awareness. So that resource is there. Thanks, Pauline. I'll pass back to you. So um, coaching is definitely um, a, very, a very unique proposition, right? It can be deployed very easily uh, at different levels, at the individual level, at the team level, at the organization level as well. So that's something we believe um, is a great tool to bring into practice into the company for the leaders to become also to develop their coaching uh, skills, but also to get coaching support um, as they need to you know, manage this um, complexity, which is for some of them quite new, um, even if they were uh, not people manager before, but just uh, get promoted people manager, it's still new also to learn on how to manage a, a hybrid team. Um, so it can be very much tailor-made to, uh, to the people um, that are needing it. So as, as you follow me since the very beginning of this webinar, you know, it's the, the shift from surviving to thriving in a hybrid workplace, it's really a key is intentionality. That's, that's the entry point and that's the, say, the new operating model for the leaders, right? To be more intentional, to be more conscious um, about, um, about that. So as I said, um, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. Oops. Um, so we need... Uh, sorry, can I ask something? Sure, please. Uh, is, uh, would that apply to all teams? Because when we speak about hybrid, you can have the 100% hybrid teams, but you can also have those yeah. who meet from time to time, but of are course. still very much working hybrid. Of course. So would you yeah, so, so it's the same for both. Any type, any type of uh, hybrid team. Um, we sometimes have clients that are uh, having a team meeting with a part of their team in the meeting room, a part of their team behind the screen. So, I mean, all the different uh, possible scenarios um, are really, you know, can be, can be uh, not solved, but can be supported with, uh, with, this, uh, with coaching and, and these other tools. Um, Alex, would you like to explain this slide? Yeah, sure. Just to mention that and, and to build on what Pauline's just said, Kirsten, I, I agree that it can apply to all different scenarios because while we're talking about hybrid creating more complexity, it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah. That's the difference <laughs> is the complexity implies that it could be dynamic hybrid could be a superpower because it allows for more working relationships, more different styles of teams to come together that may never look the same twice, <laughs> but that the intentionality is to bring the communication style, that psychological safety, so that each time the team meets in a different permutation, it can still be highly capable. Yeah, so the, so it's, it's embracing the dynamic nature without racing to the bottom of making it complicated. Well, we can only work if two thirds of the people are in room and okay, the person who's online never, they get the short end of the stick, you know, cause we're mostly talking to the people in the office. It's about creating the best possible in, in all those permutations. Um, so the thing that I would mention here is 
I already said that we're, we're talking about how coaching can be an intervention at all levels, at the system level. How does your organisation embrace hybrid, embrace this from a cultural perspective across the ways of communicating, across the ways of teaming, across the ways of leadership mindset? But then how do you use this as a superpower at all those different layers? Uh, of course, I mentioned the leader is the node, right? The leader and the manager are those nodes that bring in the way of uh, your microcultures being effective. They pass on knowledge and awareness and expectations through their teams but also working at that individual level, which is what I'm trying to, trying to indicate, um, you know, beneath the boldly, is the individual themselves also has to be activated and know I have to be intentional. If I want this beautiful life where I can choose how to work from home or work from office or work with people who are outside of my culture or across regions, then, of course, I need to bring my intentionality and, and my purpose into making this effective as well. <laughs> so from the macro down to the very personal we have to make sure that we have a new type of leader who's aware of hybrid, who wants to take this as an opportunity and really make sure that we're, we're bringing that thriving, thriving. And there's a lot of work. As Pauline said, it's emerging. We're still at the early stages. This is something I did some research on in my master's studies on coaching psychology. It's a very hot topic at the moment. And Linda Gratton is someone who I would um, point you towards if, if this is an area of research that you're looking at for your research and business too. So with that, looking at it for the whole system, I'll pass to Pauline because we've got a model here around exact skills that you, you can start coaching at for the leader. Yeah. So because most of the time before we, we have some companies or some specialists that are seeing a leader like managing work only and that is um, focusing on the performance only, right? Then you have a type of leader focusing not only, of course, but the majority of their time on the people management, okay, with these human-centered skills. And now we also have these hybrid skills. So you can consider this model as a blend that the new managers, there's these intentional hybrid leaders and managers would need to be effective, effective to uh, have a productive team as well and to get outcomes. Um, it's, it's very interesting that in this performance-focused uh, leadership skills, we mainly think about, you know, uh, providing feedback, ongoing feedback to the team. Um, I'm still surprised to hear that in many companies, you have two times in a year a performance review. And then what about in between, right? I often say that if a tennis player is getting two feedback a year, he won't, he won't <laughs> win a lot of medals, right? Or, or a lot of cups. So you need to have this ongoing feedback, what is very important with the hybrid model. Also because people don't see each other, okay? So by the moment you catch up, okay, you have this night chat to, so that you build also intimacy with your team member. At the same time also provide feedback. It can be a, a, a positive one. It can be a constructive one. So provide feedback so that you can still build on the relationship with um, your uh, team member. Um, and that will also remove the ambiguity. Why is that? Because when you will provide feedback, when you will discuss with your team member, you will be more explicit. You will communicate more openly. And that is also needed in the hybrid uh, skills. The human-centered skills are those that are, we speak about communication, we speak about coaching, we speak about showing empathy. These are three of the main uh, aspects of the human-centered skills needed for uh, intentional hybrid leader as well. In terms of the hybrid skill, if we focus on this one, it's about building a team agreement. You know, I often say that when you are in a team, you are people manager, you want to have the same, you know, the same framework, the same rules to play the game. If we don't agree on the rules up front, it's very hard to get results as well. Uh, if we play the, the game of the goose together, you might have played the game of the goose with two, um, you know, two, um, I forgot to say that. Uh, do you say that in English again? These uh, double stain, uh, Sylvie, um, <laughs> right? The, the dice, you play with two oh. dice. With some, you play with one dice. It depends from one person to the, to the other. So let's, at the beginning, read, okay, let's make a team agreement. How we will work together, right? Write down a charter, write down a routine, write down rituals that are needed in this hybrid world as well. That these are key elements and very easy to implement as an intentional hybrid leader as well. 
So if we see on the slide, it's certainly a blend between the performance focused leadership skills. They, they are needed as well, right? We, I don't say that we need to remove them, but make them explicit. The human centered skills is a way to develop. Okay, let's build more empathy with it, as a leader. Let's, let's be more explicit, be more open when you communicate. Um, let's develop also coaching skills for, for my team because I know they have the potential. So let's make them also bloom and thriving in, in the team. And this hybrid skill will be the, the, the cement between all of these, um, really about this uh, team agreement, uh, also about how do we navigate between time and place? Remember the, 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 the um, uh, schema? I'm sorry, today I'm lost in my English. Um, with time and place, constraint and constraints. So let's be clear, okay, we, we will work two days or three days uh, in the office. Okay, do we have common days or not? At what time do we come, okay? What is expected for the whole team? But make it clear for the whole team members. I think that's also um, a key element to, um, to mention. And as a manager, we also have our own biases, right? Um, it's not always easy in a new, um, this new world with more technology. Some people are not tech savvy, for instance. Um, so don't consider these a uh, difficult aspect to, to, to grasp you can get help for more junior people in your team as well, right? You have reverse mentoring. They can help you to train with technology if you are not good uh, with this aspect, um, for instance. Um, and yeah, acknowledge that previous mental models do no longer apply, right? It's a change. It's a shift. That's okay. That's a new normal, but build a new normal with your team members. There is this slide. You might have seen that on the social media, right? We, we come from this more command and control to more this shared, distributed, and compassionate way of, of leadership from micromanage and control to trust and accountability if you have no trust if you have no accountability it's very hard you know to to get results in a team where you don't see your team members every day um, about delegating tasks it's more about delegating responsibilities right we are between adults it's not like i'm the manager i'm the adult the team members are not children are not children right they are also adults so you can delegate responsibilities um, next to uh, build trust with, with them. Um, now, before that was a manager deciding on when, where, and how the work is done. Now it's more like the employees, they will decide on when, when, and how the work is done. So again, make sure that you have this team agreement up front. That will help for sure um, in, the, in, the, um, in, your, in managing your, your team members. And that's one of the one I like a lot. If we were more implicit, we, were, we saw each other a lot. So sometimes you, we, we were not communicating because that was okay because we were working together, but it's no more possible. We need to be more and more explicit um, so that uh, everything is clear and um, remove ambiguity as well. It's a better level of alignment for sure in the, in the team. Uh, Pauline, yes. I just have a question. I don't know if you will um, discuss it later, but because you said... Um, that uh, managers now need to be more empathetic, empath empathic, yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was wondering regarding harassment, because I can imagine that it's less obvious, huh? and maybe there is less harassment because people can work from home, So, then, but there must still be uh, harassment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, you have uh, also analyzed or assessed um, how whether there is less and how people deal with uh, harassment nowadays yeah. it's it's hard I, I haven't done any research but um, i can bring some cases here to the discussion is that um now with the with the you know the, the new era we are uh, more um people are seeing more out loud what is happening in the company or in the private life as well uh, i mean in terms of harassment and what I see is that um, the HR are still um, taking this as, a, as an important part of their role to um, reduce and make sure that it doesn't happen anymore. And by that, most of the time, or one of, I mean, I'm not a specialist in harassment, but what I can tell is that um, people that are also in this mode are micromanaging a lot. So are they good people managers? That's a good question. Are they able to delegate, to give empowerment to their team members, um, you know, to, um, to make sure that they are, they are 
uh, having their team members more, more responsible and accountable. So what I've seen recently in one of my clients, um, the HR manager knew it and they um, made a, a meeting with the, 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 the two people that are the two stakeholders. They made a meeting, they, they arrange everything. They, they've been able to speak about that. And the person who was complaining was also able to bring it quite quickly. So it's one example. I don't have many examples, and I'm sure there are other examples that are maybe with, with another uh, consequence, another result. Um, but I don't have um, as such research on this on this topic. I don't know from you, Alex, from your knowledge also from the market. No research. You have my mind ticking now, Christine, to think about it. But I um, no research in that space. One thing I would say is that it does open up. I don't know if it's harassment, but I definitely see... Um, for people who wish that everything was back to normal and that we were back to 100% work from office, the discomfort of this change can manifest in some attempts to influence other people around them in effective and ineffective ways. So maybe that could become a harassment in some cases. I do hear younger staff who feel like Okay, even though the law says this and even though my boss says that, the big boss is sending a very strong signal that, you know, work from home, you're not going to get promoted or, you you know, you won't necessarily, you know, thrive here. So in my sense, in my mind, I don't have any research, but I think it can open up this new form of harassment <laughs> of, you know. Um, the only other thing that I'd say, and this is less related to the EU where we have GDPR, but... I would say a lot of companies outside of EU where we have seen the rise of AI in work tools um, for online meetings, there is a lot of AI note taking that gives automatic feedback to who spoke, which percentage, how much psychological safety was used in this, in this meeting. So there would be scenarios where either, no problem, Kirsten, thank you for joining um, if you need to go now. The, um, if, if there was harassment coming up in this new online world of work where this AI is coming, it would be flagged. And so I think that that will either divert some people to not use the tools if they think they have a natural harassing style and, or it might catch and give feedback to some of those. So complex and, and interesting question, but I think those are the things on our horizon mm -hmm. with relation. Yeah. yeah. I, I do know, I, I spoke to a um, candidate uh, mm -hmm. coming from a huge uh, consultancy and he said that uh, some of the partners really gave almost a public beating online. So mm -hmm. where all partners were involved and then the next line of, of regional managers, etc., and then they could really pick on just one person. And he said, and this, the terrible thing was that you were sitting there, part of it, feeling terrible for that person. But he said, at the end of the day, no one there to speak up. It was only afterwards when they were outside of the meeting. So yes, if, the, if there is a kind of culture anyway, you know, top bottom, uh, not delegating or being the way you 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 speak to your personnel or the, the people reporting into you is that way. Then it's very easy to embarrass people even more um, with just a Teams or online. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. And some of that, as you say, it's at the cultural level. It would have happened offline. Now it's happening online. I think the, the big difference is so many of our calls are now recorded. <laughs> so I have had clients who've had complaints of, of misconduct come to them and then they're actually able to go back and view the recordings and now from a legal and technical perspective say, oh, no, 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 you have a misunderstanding of what bullying is there. You had an emotional response and that actually, you know, and, and technically can come down on either side of the party. <laughs> you know, yes, that was bullying. No, it wasn't bullying because now we have the proof of what happened in that conversation or that instance. So I think it's um, it's a whole new kettle of fish, but I, yeah, mm. don't have a conclusive. Thank you. So Pauline, I'm yes. thinking in the interest of time, maybe if yes. I just go through slide 23 briefly. what I wanted to say as well. So yeah. we align. Let me, um, is this one? Wait. Yeah, no, the last one. Yeah. yeah. Give me go a second. Back to 23. The, the, so one thing I would say um, 
is we've got a lot of resources that we will share after this call because just in the interest Wait, I'm of, sorry of, because of... Uh, I think my system is not uh, working as it best this one no back to 23 two three okay. and then I'll yeah, just go I don't have the same numbers here so uh, let me just share some coaching questions these are some practical things because we're talking about leaders who um, are having challenges with control and we we're saying that coaching is one effective way that we could be you know intervening here's some questions and we will share them with you afterwards as well because we we've got them aligned these kind of questions aligned to all of those aspects of the model that Pauline shared but if I have a, a leader or a manager in front of me who is struggling with this transition somebody who I know is a node who is important for that culture to influence to to shift the um, the mental model some questions that we can ask what might it look like if you will relinquish some control in this situation we're not saying that you have to be 100% work from home team we're not saying you have to be 100% work from office just imagine with me what would it look like if we had less control in this scenario um, what strategy are you using to respond to the messiness you're perceiving in this hybrid world again it's bringing intentionality it's not just your a passenger on a ship that set sail and oh you better go with it it's no you're the leader let's think about how you're driving this we're heading into the hybrid world but let's think about your steering and your capacity you do have agency here you do have you know a sense of influence it's just not the influence to say let's go back to the old ways what do you anticipate the workplace will evolve to over time you might hear some fantastic perspectives of well it's just going to go back to the way it was everything will trend or you might hear some futuristic, you know, everybody's going to have a chip in their ear and I'll be, you know, working with bots. So getting a sense of like, what is this person responding to? Why are they having maybe an anxiety response or a defense response to the hybrid workplace? And then what does your personal, how does your personal history impact your expectations of the workplace now? As Pauline said at the beginning, most of us probably started you know, she said nine to five. I was thinking that sounds great. I was like, my first job was eight to six. And if I wasn't at my desk, if I was 10 minutes late, I was late, you know, there was no working back. So we probably all came from a much stricter, much more performative version of a workplace. And now this, what feels loose, what feels messy, what feels mature and grown up could be very scary for people who didn't quite handle the dynamics of management before. And now it's even harder. <laughs> so this understanding their personal history of, yeah, if you grew up wearing black shoes, black trousers, a tie, and you had to wear your jacket because otherwise you weren't in uniform, that's a very restricted form of work that somehow we're now asking the new mental model to move into. So understanding and, and having empathy for that person who's gone through change and who's now leading an organisation and might be wishing that they were back to what they understood is a beginning point to helping the whole system, um, you know, get to where it might otherwise be and, and thrive. So I'll pause there because we've got so many of these coaching questions and things that we think we can help with, but I know we've come to time. So, yeah, Pauline, let me hand. Um, I, I've explained the model very briefly. You've got the main takeaways from the model. So being performance-led, uh, human-centric-led or hybrid-led, it's a blend of the three of the three uh, aspects of this circle that you have seen with tools like, uh, you know, coaching skills, uh, um, feedback, uh, team agreements, and so on. Um, because it's it's the new normal and it's because also it's the, it's time. Um, is there any question, any other question uh, that you have uh, based on what we have shared here? Yes, I'm, I'm just curious, but indeed it's also probably research-based and probably you don't have real, real answers on this, but so we're looking for an intentional leader, you know, the new leaders. Is there a research, men versus women, where we could say women are automatically more inclined to be an intentional leader than men, or is that not true at all? Well, the first thing I'd say is I'll call out that we're all women on this call, so it would be very easy for us to draw a conclusion. It's a pity because I would have loved to see men exactly. on this call as well, yeah, Agreed. Agreed. to understand their view, yeah. I have an instinct, but it's, of course, not universal. I, I think we, we do have to give credit to the nuance. Um, my 
in the interest of time, my very boiled down statement is that um, in general, females are more empathic leaders. So I would say yes, in that sense. In general, women have had roles where they've had to balance more and find more solutions for work and life, which means that they're probably operating in a more dynamic sense of a leadership um, model themselves to create this new concept of, of um, yeah, creative ways of getting work done, non-traditional ways of getting work done. So my sense is that there would be a lot there. However, I know some fantastic, of course we do know some fantastic um, male leaders who have what we call complexity of mind, of course, that ability to know that work is happening no matter where you're, you know, sitting <laughs> um, and who can see that they want to get outcomes through systems, not, not just time punched on a stamp. So let's say all genders, but I definitely think <laughs> that there will, there will be some tendencies. And then same question, but then with regard to culture. You know, it, it, we know, for instance, that indeed in the Nordics, uh, we tend to look at Scandinavia specifically, where we have the feeling, but we don't know, at least I don't have that research, you know, that they are automatically, uh, they seem to have a lot of things in order. Let me put it like, mm. that. you know, that mm. we, we are all looking at like, oh, that looks fantastic. Mm. Yeah, my brief answer there would be, you know, the, the it's obviously been going for a long time, but the most effective and large scale macro research is Hofstede's uh, research into how the different cultures behave. I'm sure there's somebody researching how to use those models in the hybrid. My sense would be that it probably comes down to power distance. Cultures that have a higher power distance of command and control probably have more of a tendency to move back to office because it's if I can't see you, then I don't, I can't control you. Whereas the lower power distance, I think are probably more likely to be more comfortable with the out of office or the more hybrid scenarios. I would also say cultures that are stereotypically high, um, high output, high productivity are probably more comfortable being out of office because there's a level of trust in outcomes as opposed to inputs and processes. If you have low productivity cultures or places where we're just learning, you know, emerging markets or where culturally it's it's less, less output put per human, it's more likely to be driving back to office because again, that line of sight and visibility is a sense of I can drive and, and impact outputs if I can, um, yeah, micromanage, as Pauline said. <laughs> it's easier to micromanage face-to-face -face than, <laughs> than online. So yeah, I don't think there's research yet, just because we're so early. But I would assume it would take some of those some of those factors into consideration. Thank you. Question. So thank you very much, everyone, for for your time. Uh, we can stay a little longer if you have other questions, uh, because I'm conscious that it's um, time for some of you maybe to jump to the next meeting. So thank you very much for joining today's session. It has been really a pleasure yeah, to be thank challenged you, on this topic Alex. with you. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. I liked thank it. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. I have to leave, unfortunately, but it was really interesting. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Really, very interesting. Thanks. Um, yes, I love the appreciate the conversational style. It's, it's, it's nice. We can all participate. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I'm glad you could join. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. See you. Thanks, Sarah.